Good evening, everybody. Or as we say informally, hi. I'm John Nicholson, the director of the Newhouse Sports Media Center. And this, of course, is our honored guest, Dick Stockton, Hall of Fame sportscaster, generally recognized as one of the top 50 sportscasters ever. I think, actually, it's a smaller group that he's among, but he's pretty humble about that kind of stuff. When we started the Sports Media Center about two and a half years ago, we recognized a pantheon of people in sports media who went to SU. And we tried to get every one of them to come here to speak at forums such as this. One of the people I've been hoping to get from the beginning is Dick Stockton. And here he is. So the way it will work is I'm going to ask him some questions for 10, 15 minutes or so to give you some ideas of things you might want to ask about. And then we'll open it up to questions for <coughs> quite a good period of time. And when we're finished, as always, our tradition here, you'll be able to come down, shake Dick's hand, take selfies with him, press your business cards upon him, ask him, please, can you have a job and stuff like that, and we'll see what he has to say. But let's start at the beginning. If I recall, the beginning was in Philadelphia, but pretty soon, you were in Queens. And what was your name when you were born? What did, what did your parents name you? You know, uh, I forgot. It was, uh, <laughs> I was known as R Ricky. They called me Ricky. Stockvis. It was a Dutch name. S-T-O-K-V-I-S. Stockvis. It's a very popular name in Holland. It means fisherman. So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> How did Stockton come about and when in your life? Came about when I was, uh, got my first real job <clears throat> on the air in Philadelphia. And um, I was, uh, see what happened was is that uh, they were auditioning new people and the weatherman was, had to go to Cleveland. There was a trade between Cleveland and Philadelphia and Group W stations. So they say, is there anyone down in the radio newsman? The room could come up and just be a mannequin, just act like a weather guy. So someone said, stock this, you go up and do this. So I go up there and I said, there's a low pressure coming in from the Pacific and then a high pressure and assist. A year later, they're looking for a weekend sportscaster at the TV station because I was doing all night radio news. Great job, 10.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. I loved it in Philadelphia, first job, 22 years old. And so, Guy says, who was that guy that did the weather a year ago? I want him to audition for the weekend sports catch. So I did and I got the job. And I got the job by ad-libbing for 10 minutes of the, about the mid-season baseballs. How was I going to beat guys that have been in the business? I ad-libbed, I looked at the camera and I say, National League, I went over every team. And they, so they hired me. And then uh, he says, uh, he used to smoke a pipe. His name was Wynn Baker. He invented a concept called Eyewitness News, which you might have remembered Eyewitness News in cities around America. So anyway, he brings me up and he says, smokes his pipe. He was, uh, went to Tulane. He was a genius broadcaster, tough. He was like a Lombardi kind of guy. And he said, stop this. What, what, stop, what is, people know what, when you say it, they don't know what it is. And when they see it, they don't come up with something else. Okay, Stockton. Stock, that was Stockton. Good. That was it. And so that's, then I was, and so on the radio station, uh, they put out a little bulletin that was on the bulletin board. From now on, uh, Dick Stock, this is now Dick Stockton. But invariably, you know, they, they would forget. So they say, now for the next half hour of our, you know, uh, radio, all news radio, 1060 on your radio dial, KYW, Philadelphia. Here is Dick Stockfist. Uh, Stockton, Stockton, Stockton. <laughs> so that's how it started, and then it, it, uh, that's what happened. As a kid in Queens, tell us where in Queens, and tell us how you became a fan of sports. Well, I grew up uh, in Kew Garden Hills, not far from Paul, where Paul Simon was. We were later waiters at a camp together in Long Island, Bellport, Long Island. Both of us were fired as waiters from there. And after, and after the dinners, he used to come in and strum the guitar, Paul Simon. And, uh, you know, he wanted to be like the old Everly brothers at the time. 
And I saw him years later. I'm going to get to the answer. Years later, I saw him and I said, whatever happened to you after Ken? You know. <laughs> so uh, my, my father was in the printing business. And uh, he was a great sports fan and had season tickets to the New York baseball giants at the polo grounds where they played before they moved to San Francisco. Polo grounds? What's that? That was the park that they had in Manhattan. It was Yankee Stadium, Polo Grounds, Ebbets Field in Brooklyn where the Dodgers played before they moved to LA and San Francisco. He would take me to these games and it would explain everything to me that was going on. He got me these baseball cards, Bowman cards, 19. I, I, I'll give you the year. It was, it was a, you guys were young at the time, 51, 1951. <laughs> he got me a card and I saw Al Red Shandienst. Second base, St. Louis Cardinals. That switch, switch hitter, throws right, born Germantown, Illinois. I said, wow, I love these cards. He took me to, he took me to the polo grounds, and they were playing the St. Louis Cardinals. And we were in the dark, dungy, you know, inner sanctum of the polo grounds. The park was out there. We walked out, and there was Red Chaney's, real life Red Chaney's. And when I saw the green of the polo grounds, and I saw the, heard the music, and heard batting practice and the, the bat in it, I said, this is what I want to do in my life. That's what happened. Right then and there. I was uh, nine, eight years old and I knew what I wanted to do. You were in the polo grounds in 1954 for the World Series with the Indians. Tell us what happened then. Well, that was the game. Can you all hear me, by the way? That was the game in which Willie Mays made one of the greatest catches of all time, over the shoulder. Over the shoulder in center field, robbing Vic Wirtz of extra bases. He caught this ball. My father said, stand on this chair and watch this drive. And, I, and he made the catch. It was the, one of the greatest catches of all time. But before the game, we're sitting there. And all of a sudden, these photographers are standing in front of us, sitting and kneeling in front of me, taking pictures of me. And my father's to my right, and I'm here. And I'm saying, Dad, what, what are they doing? Why are they taking pictures of me? He turns around, he looks, and he says, Take a look around. You know who this person is? And I looked around. And I said, no, I have no idea. He's this General Douglas MacArthur. They thought I was MacArthur's son. <laughs> that was my highlight. How did you decide to come to, come to Syracuse? Uh, it was very meticulous the way I decided how I was coming here. I mean, I studied books and I studied Actually, who was going to win between Penn State and Syracuse in 1959? They were both undefeated. They were both 7-0 and or 8-0. and I don't know what they were. And I told my dad I wanted to study journalism. There was no Newhouse School, and I never thought about being on the air ever. I wanted to be a sports writer, sports writer. And uh, I said, Dad, Penn State has a good journalism school. Syracuse, I have both applications. Whoever wins this game, that's, what I'm, that's where I'm going to go. And Syracuse won 20 to 18. They blocked a kick. They win the game 20 to 18 at State College. And I fill out the application, and that's when I decided Syracuse. So without a block kick, you're not here tonight. That's right. I'd be, I'd be at State or worse yet, you're here as a Penn State alum. <laughs> that's right. Or, and that would be worse. <laughs> did you ever become a sports writer? Did you work for the Daily Orange or anything like that? What happened when you? Well, got yes, in? I did. I, I went in. You know. I was very shy. I was shy in high school, and I, you know, I was. I didn't. I didn't have any dates, by the way, until I. I, I really didn't have any dates. It'd be Saturday night. I'd be listening to the radio to hear out of town games, out of town hockey games, and I would be trying to get the station. And you get the crackly, I, and and I hear a hockey game or a basketball game, and my mother would walk by and she'd say, "Joe, what's wrong with our son?" You know. <laughs> so. Uh, I wrote for the Daily Orange, and, uh, and, and from there, I, I worked on weekends at the Syracuse Herald Journal. And I was a copy boy there, but I also covered uh, Syracuse freshman football and basketball. And that was when I was writing. And, uh, you, know, in, you know, and I also had worked at WAER, but I wanted to be a sports writer. But you did find that little tin shack over where the Flanagan is now. I as a freshman. I did, and uh, it was very interesting because a friend of mine who had gone to the Columbia School of Journalism, broadcast he wanted to be an announcer in the worst way, never became one. We're playing intramural basketball in that old gym, which, you know, John took me around campus today. Great memories. I've seen it a few times, but not for a while. And uh, 
Across was the old World War II Quonset Huts, which was WAR, and he says to me, why don't you audition for WAER? Why don't you audition for the campus? I said, I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. Come on, just go in and do it. So I auditioned, it was a Friday, and then on Monday, I see my name down there to do a music show, a newscast, a sports cast, whatever it was, and I got into it, and I, I kind of liked it. Were you, in fact, the sports director as a freshman? I was. I was, the, I was the first freshman ever named sports director of a senior staff position. And, uh, and I liked it because I could do about a few basketball games at the Onondaga War Memorial before Manly Fieldhouse was built. And they had uh, capacity. What do you have now, 30,000 fans? They had about 1,500 people watching a team that had lost 21 straight games. And I had to lower my voice because the players were hearing it on the court. So uh, it was, that was what I had at the time. But then later on in your college career, you wanted to be sports director again. Yes. Not, and that it, didn't work out. No, it was, it, was, it was actually the next year. And they say, what do you want to be? You know, you were a senior staff physician, you were a sports director. And I said, well, I'd like to be the sports director again. And then I didn't get it. They gave it to somebody else. And I said, I was really down about that. You know, I, and I, I went to somebody, went to some faculty, I said, let me ask you, seriously tell me, why couldn't I be the sports director again? When you said that, we felt you had no ambition. We thought you'd be the sales manager, news director, program manager, general manager. You had no ambition. That's why I'm very suspect of faculty. I am too. <laughs> Do you recall who did get the job as sports director? Barry, I forget his last name. Do you know who it is? I don't, but I'm pretty yeah. sure he's not a Barry famous Schwartz. sportscaster today. I think it was Barry, I think it was, he, you know what? And he was good at getting the lines, phoning the, getting the phone lines in yeah. the games. That was key. And by the way, he became a very successful uh, radio station owner over the years. In fact, the other guy who wanted the job was Marv Albert, who was a year ahead of me, who was already working downtown doing disc jockey shows. So Marv and I weren't good enough to be the sports director at Syracuse University. <laughs> but you were being paid professionally to do all kinds of broadcasting around central New York. Were you and Marv good friends when you were undergrads? Yes, we were. Uh, you know, when I came here, uh, you know, he already, I mean, he was so... He was so far ahead of anybody in, in this business for his age because he was doing at, at a radio station WOLF. I don't know if it still exists today, but it was a disc jockey show and he was with dedications. And so he was doing that. And then when Marty Glickman uh, would go on long trips, he'd have Marv do Knicks and Ranger games. And here I was, you know, I was happy at WAER, but I'm saying, gee, someday I'd like to be something like Marv out, you know. and. Uh, we, we, we've always, you know, stayed close. NBA has been the, you know, the, he's always loved the NBA. And I did the NBA for nine years before he took over when NBC took the contract away from CBS. We always talk about Marty as the godfather of everything sports media here at SU. Have you ever had a relationship, did you, with Marty? As yes, I did. Later on, tell yeah, us about through, that. Actually, um, uh, I was working in Boston at WBZ doing uh, the TV shows there, the nightly sports. And I get a call, Dick, Marty Glickman here. <laughs> They're starting a new cable thing called Home Box Office. I'd like you to do some play-by-play -play for Home <coughs> Box Office. There are no commercials, no commercials. You'll be doing double headers of college basketball in Madison Square Garden. Not only do we not go to commercial, there's no halftime break, and no break between games. You interview anyone you want. You can talk to the cheerleaders, you can talk to the coaches, assistant coaches. The greatest training I ever had, TV, was working at home box office when they had 8,000 subscribers in Wilkes-Barre and Scranton. What's happened to home box office since? I don't know. <laughs> I've heard it's done all yeah, right. It's done all right. It's done. Did you ask him, what if I need to use the men's room? I never asked him that question. And you know what? I don't think I ever had to go. It's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. 
So these days when somebody comes out of SU who wants to be a broadcaster, particularly play-by-play, -play, but also uh, a sports television host, sports anchor, etc., you generally can go into Kalispell, or you're going to Kearney, Nebraska, or you're going to West Texas somewhere. You went into some pretty big places right away. Tell us about that. I did. I, I, uh, well, uh, I got this connection with Group W because I was, as I, as I mentioned at dinner, I, was, uh, I got a, a job as the farm reporter on WIBX in Utica, New York, between my uh, uh, sophomore and junior years. And I was so excited uh, you know, to have that, to actually do commercial radio. And then uh, Group W, Westinghouse Broadcasting, which owned a lot of stations, many, many, many of you may remember WBZ in Boston, KPI in San Francisco, whatever. They, they wanted to get some interns who would be in the management training program. They were going to select eight interns to work a 10-week summer thing. And they came to Syracuse competing against guys from 10 other schools. And I was fortunate enough to be selected. And I went to KDKA in Pittsburgh, and I worked in the radio department for 10 weeks in every department, the music department, public affairs, sales, uh, news, everything. And, uh, and that's what I did. But, but I, they liked what I did there, and they never forgot me. And so when I uh, got out of school, I was at Fort Dix for six months in the Army Reserve. They hired me to be a, um, a copy boy at WINS in New York. Uh, first, I was a producer of a show called Stan Bernard Contact, it was an interview show, and uh, uh, one time I was the guy that would get coffee and also say, will you please turn down your radio, you please, you're going to go on with Stan in a minute. But uh, on one particular weekend, it was a Friday, and they said, Dick, will you go downstairs and get this guest? Malcolm X was going to be on the show, and he had all of his friends with him, his cohorts, and they came up. And I and to talked to them, and I just you know, kept them busy before they went into the show. And Malcolm X had a debate uh, with somebody on the radio. And at the end of the debate, he said, come to the Sunday. Come to Harlem on Sunday. I'm going to go speak. And you'll hear what I have to say. And that's when he got assassinated. What was he like to you as a guy who was just taking him around and helping him in his entourage. Reasonable out. guy, wasn't that long. It was didn't about chat with you much? a half hour. Well, I mean, we just talked about things, but you know, I didn't get into issues because I didn't want him to get to talk a lot because he was gonna go on the radio, mm -hmm. but he was pleasant. And, his, and, and, and all of the people around him were pleasant. But and I never when, when he was that. killed, what was your thought? What was your reaction to that? I mean, this was the first exposure I ever had with you know, somebody who was you know, uh, in, in the public eye, who was a, a national figure with tragedy involved, you know, and it, uh, it was stunning. I mean, I never, I mean, I never forgot the, the entire experience of having somebody come in and just welcoming them to the show. So you move forward. Eventually, you spend a good deal of time in Boston. And you can tell us about the different experiences there. I do want to hear the story about Red Auerbach. But first, what about Gene Kirby? Well, before Gene Kirby, I, and this is what I would like to talk to you guys about, because, um, you know, when you, you know, have a career like I've had, and you, you talk about all the successes, like, you know, John, kind enough to say top 50, uh, you know, I don't know about that. But, uh, you know, I've had, you know, I called Carl Fisk home run in the 75 World Series. I did uh, the Olympics when Dan Jansen won the speed skating uh, gold medal. Uh, you know, I called all of the Celtics Lakers playoffs in the 1980s. I've had great things. They say, man, it's been great. You, what, a, what a great time. And yet it has been great. Any pitfalls? Yes. And I want to talk to you guys and gals about things that will happen when you get out of the field that won't go according to form. When because somebody likes somebody better, they will uh, take them over you, and you'll say, wait a second, I have more ability, I think, you know, and you'll have to go with what the management says. How do you handle yourself in these circumstances? And I've always handled myself in a good way, but when I was younger, there was a time that I decided to fight back. And this was a time when I was working in Boston, and I was, you know, one of the reasons why I had some success as a local sportscaster on the newscast was that I did commentaries, which we have plenty of today, but at the time it didn't exist. And the same guy, Wynn Baker, who hired me, said, I want you to do 
a commentary where you're going to be critical. You can praise, critical, but I want you to have thoughts and opinion, and they can be tough. And I don't, I, I'm not even going to go into the names of some of the people that I criticize, you know, because I may be embarrassed to, to mention who they are today, so I won't do that. But anyway, what happened is that you then feel that you wake up in the morning and you say, who am I going, who am I going to get on today? You know, is it going to be Roberto Clemente? Is it going to be, is it going to be Billy Sullivan, the owner? And, and so you become a negative person because you're thinking of negatives. And so there was a time that came that I said to myself, you know, I, I love sports. When my dad took me to the polo grounds, I loved sport. I loved watching games. I loved it. And now, you know, I'm negative. Not all the time, but I didn't want to be negative at all. So I went to the same guy, Wynn Baker, and I said, Wynn, you, own, you have rights to 30 or 40 Boston Red Sox games, on weekends mostly, I'd like to go in on a weekend and do an inning. Let me do an inning or two, just so I can satisfy my desire to get into play-by-play, -play, which I've never done. And he said, Dick, you don't have the ability to do play-by-play. -play. That didn't strike me right. You know, he could have given a lot of reasons, but he said the wrong thing. <laughs> so I got a lawyer and I sued the company to get out of my contract. And we reached a settlement where I had one year to go, and when I, I left the, co the company, and I moved to New York City with no job to freelance to try to get play-by-play -play jobs, okay? I had nothing. I had, then Marty Glickman came along, I had some HBO, but scattered stuff. And then about a few months later, I get a call from him in Boston. He says, I'd like you to come back and be the voice of the Boston Celtics. We do 20 games a year. I said, when? I don't have the ability to do play-by-play. -play. <laughs> I had to say that, Dick. I didn't want you to lose the desire to do the commentaries on the news. I came back. Bob Cousy and I were the broadcasters of the Boston Celtics. We did 20 games for uh, two years. Then at the end of that second year, I get a call from, well, actually, it was the beginning. It was like uh, April, March, April, which is still a basketball season. And Gene Kirby was the assistant general manager of the Boston Red Sox. And he says, WBZ, the station that you've worked for, is losing the rights to the Red Sox. They're going to a UHF station, WSBK in Boston. We're going to do 100 games. Your name has been mentioned as a possible play-by-play -play guy. Have you ever done baseball before? I said, no. He says, well, take a tape recorder and go to Yankee Stadium and do it. Actually, it was the Shea Stadium. The Yankee Stadium was being refurbished. And do a game and send me the tape. This is in April. And we'll critique it. So I sent him the tape. And he's called me in a week. Called him in a week. He says, Dick, you got a legal pad handy? I said, yeah. Let's go. He says, you were horrendous. <laughs> Here's what you did wrong. He went pitch by pitch for nine innings. I mean, I'm not saying I was all bad, but I had seven pages of legal paper written out with things I did wrong. He said, get a tape recorder, go back and do another game. Did the same thing, same result. Seven times I went back to do a tape. Finally in September, he said, I can now recommend you to be the Red Sox announcer. And Ken Harrelson and I became the Red Sox announcer. And who knew about fate? One year later, I broadcast the World Series and call one of the great plays ever. When Gene gave you the critique <clears throat> and the ensuing critiques, did you bristle at all? Were you totally receptive? What was your bristle? I was going to. I was thinking, maybe I can't do this. I never. I mean, this guy was worked with the top broadcasters in the business before that in the game of the week. Uh, no, I didn't bristle, but I was determined to go back and succeed because this is what I wanted to do. And the answer is, you don't quit. You don't let other people tell you you can't do it. Now, he did it in a, con in a constructive way because he could have said after one time, 
he can't do it, forget about him. But he came back, he wanted me to succeed, I wanted to do it for him too, and it worked. But, you know, the thing you can't worry about when you go out in the field, and I know it's a different time now than it was when I was in your chair, and that is, it's not about how much money you're gonna make, forget that, you know? You're gonna do it because you wanna do it, because you have a love for doing it and you have the passion. You're gonna be persistent, and you're going to follow orders and you're not going to fight management because they win all the time. Not some of the time, all the time. If you don't like it, leave and go find something else. But if your pride is so big and you're not humble enough, you have no chance of succeeding. Sacrifice, someone says, I've gone to people, it's, now I remember in Boston, I talked to the broadcasting students and they said, I said, would you work? from 10.30 at night to 6.30 in the morning, six nights a week for $200 a week. That's what it was at that time. It would be more now. No way. What kind of life would I have? I said, thank you. You, won't, you have no chance. You have to sacrifice. You, have, you never know when the break is gonna come. Um, I know today that youngsters and people your age are, you know, uh, you know, I should say, express themselves to higher ups more readily than we did, okay? Uh, if you want to succeed, bury the pride, bury the ego, do the job, know that it's going to take some time maybe, don't worry about the money, that only comes with ultra success, ultimate success. If you don't do these things, you're not going to make it. But everyone in this room can make it and do what you want to do you have the passion to do it, be determined to do it, and just don't make waves and follow the orders and work hard. And usually the ones that are the quietest make it. You've worked with a lot of partners over the years, and I do want to come back to the Fisk home run, but first you mentioned Hawk Carroll. Does that make an impression? <laughs> Does it seriously hey, what I said? See, here's the thing. I don't we, know. We tell them that, but when you tell them that, no, really. Now you're listening? How many here are saying, what are you talking about? Raise your hands if you think, it, honestly, I'm not going to take names. What's his name? No, I'm, I'm not going to take I, I any names. I'm not going to do any of that. How many people here? I, I want to know this because this is, what, this is why I'm here. I'm not here for any, any, anything other than helping you guys. Um, do you believe what I'm saying? Do you believe it? Yes. yes. Okay. Are you raising your right hand to swear there? No, no, no. no, no I'm serious. Okay. I'm serious. No, this, not yet. Stand by one. Let me take you back to, I can't leave Hawk hanging out there, although the Hawk does hang in Chicago. I've worked <laughs> with should. a lot of people over the years, but at first, you and Hawk Harrelson didn't mesh quite so well. After a while, you worked it out. How did that go? Well, you know, Hawk, um, you know, Hawk like, wanted to get on the pro golf tour, you know, so, you know, Hawk would, on the road, would be putting in, in front of mirrors, you know, and, and he played golf all the time. And, uh, you know, he, he was from, I was from New York, and he was from Savannah, Georgia, and we were poles apart, but he respected the fact that I could do something that he didn't do at the time, play by play, which he does now, and he was a character. That's why they hired him because he was a character. He had the hawk walk, he wore Nehru suits. This is years ago. Look it up sometime. You'll see what, how ridiculous they were. And Hawk Harrelson was a character. But we had fun together. Our first broadcast, our first broadcast that we ever did was an exhibition game, Grapefruit League game at Chain of Lakes Park in Winnebago. We had never done a game together. And, uh, and so he, we're talking about a guy, and I said, Tim Foley of the Montreal Expos, and he says, you know what I like about Tim Foley? He has a good pair of, and he said it. And I said, what did, you, what did he say? And then after the game, he said, you can't do this. And we got ripped in Boston, the Boston Globe. These guys are clowns. I, I, Hawk thought we never were going to make opening day. But we made opening day, and we had a good season, and, and so we, we, we worked together for four years. <clears throat> I want to come back to some of the other partners you worked with, but first, the Fisk home run. We talked about this at dinner tonight, the lessons that can be taken from how that was called. 
Is it fresh in your mind, and what can you tell us about how you feel you did that well, and what we all can learn from how that Well, was? I don't know. At the time, I, I, you know, people always say, um, do you know how important it is? You never know how important an event is. Only time will tell after the fact. All it was that night was a home run in the 12th inning that the Red Sox sent the World Series to a seventh game. And it was a dramatic home run. That was it. They were singing and dancing in Boston at nearly 1 o'clock in the morning. But um, so I was doing the World Series, and I was the Red Sox announcer. There was the Reds announcer, Marty Brenneman, working with Kurt Gowdy, Tony Kubek, and Joe Garagiola from NBC. And I did game one on, on TV with uh, Kurt, and I did game four on radio with Kurt, and now it was game six. And uh, what happened was is that this was a game in which the Reds could clinch the World Series, and they wanted to have the NBC voice call the last out, which of course they would. Not, they didn't want to have a team guy. So they said, Dick, uh, you'll do the first four and a half innings, and Kurt will do the, uh, but it wasn't Kurt, it was Joe Garagiola. Kurt was on radio. We'll do the last four and a half, and Joe Garagiola is our top guy. So anyway, that's the way it worked. The game is 6-6, they go to extra innings. What are we gonna do now? Chet Simmons, the head of NBC Sports, they said, let's just alternate innings. So I did the 10th, <coughs> Joe did the 11th, I did the 12th. Being at the right place at the right time, someone's looking over you. I was do doing the game when Fisk hit the second pitch in the bottom of the 12th inning to win the game, and one, it was named by TV guy the most exciting baseball moment in, in history. So I'm calling this game, and Fisk, the count is 1-0 to Fisk, and he hits, a, he hits a shot. Now, when you're doing play-by-play -play and you're doing baseball, and there's a ball hit deep to center, like last night, if you watch the World Series, and Gordon ties it up, sends the game into extra inning, and there's a drive deep to center field, way back, it's gone, and it's time. That's one way. Then you have the ball that is a shot down the line in a nanosecond. What do you do then? Similar to what Joe Buck had when, when uh, Mark McGuire hit his 70th home run in St. Louis, right down the line. He hits a shot down the line, so it's instinct. You can't plan it. If it stays fair, First thing, if it stays fair, pause, home run. And then the place went nuts. And then I shut up. For 36 seconds, I did not say a word. As he went around the bases, fans coming out, grabbing at him. John Kiley, the organist at Fenway Park, hallelujah chorus, you hear the music, nothing. Place is going wild. Red Sox are at home plate, they mob fist. I said nothing, because what's better than pictures and sounds? Now, it's not that way today, folks, as you all know. It's wall-to-wall -wall talk, it's people screaming, and you're not listening to them. What are they saying? What's better on TV than the pictures and the sounds of an event, the director cutting pictures, the despondent Reds, the elated Red Sox, Fisk waving his arms, come home, mobbed at home plate. And all I said after that as he went into the dugout is that we will have a seventh game to this 1975 World Series, and that was it. And it was pure instinct. I know that Vince Scully, the great Dodger announcer, has done it. It's a matter of technique. I, I, I didn't know that, but he has done it. I didn't invent it. But that was what made that moment important, the 36 seconds after I said, if it stays fair. You're still proud of that. Well, it's, you know, I was 32 years old at the time, John, and I said, you know, this is a great moment, I, and I don't know what my career is going to be, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to have some great, nothing has surpassed that moment. It's not number one, number one, and always number one. And the two little, two funny things about that is every time I've seen Fisk, I said, Pudge. Without my call, what, what would have happened? <laughs> and he looks at me. And then, of course, Johnny Bench. When I run into Johnny Bench, which I do all the time, he says to me, Dick, just remember who won that World Series. I said, Johnny, I think they called it off after six games, three and three. I don't think they played a seventh game. So. 
But your career then continued at a very high level, as it does to this moment. <coughs> CBS, Fox, football, baseball, Winter Olympics, and practically anything one can think of. Over the years, you've worked with a lot of terrific people. In recent years, you've said to me, it's kind of been your job to break in people as analysts. What's that about? How is that work? Well, that's what, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very fortunate to have that role. I mean, the way the business works, um, you know, uh, I, was, I was mentioning to John and the, and the, and the guys at dinner that, uh, you know, uh, there was a producer, a producer who used to produce all of John Madden and Pat Summerall's football games for 21 years. Uh, you know, he was in his mid to late 60s, I think, and they moved him to a different team and they put another guy in, not to Madden Summerall, but, uh, yes, but I think it was Madden Summerall, they had a younger guy. And he said to me, I'm really distraught because uh, I, I'm better than this guy, I'm better than these people. And I said, Bob, how old were you when you took over the number one CBS producing job? He says, 31. I said, the guy whose place you took, did he not think he was better than you at the time and could still do the job? It's the nature of life, and you have to understand it. And the fact that you're still working is a great thing. So I have understood, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, happy in, with myself to know that the fact that I'm still doing things is great, because after a while, there's a new wave who deserve to be doing games, who are coming on. So my role, Fox says, is to develop and nurture and mentor our football broadcasters. So our top five analysts at Fox are Troy Aikman, Daryl Johnston, John Lynch, Charles Davis, and Rondé Barber. I broke in all five of those guys, and I'm proud of that. And they always send me notes, uh, you know, and look, it, I'm not responsible for their success. They are. They had to have the talent to do it. it. I, you know, I just played a role in it. Right now I'm working with David Deal, the former Gi New York Giants left tackle. We're doing the Rams 49ers game this week. And, you know, last year he had a full schedule. Things didn't go that well. And they said, oh, can we save this guy? Dick, you got him. And they like what he's done so far. So that is my role right now, and I love it. I do the Chris Webber. He, Chris Webber never had done a game before I worked with him at Turner, and now he's the number one analyst. Steve Kerr, same thing when we did the San Antonio Spurs. I get great pleasure out of that because it's not about me anymore. I've done everything I could do, and my idea now when I do a broadcast with anybody is how do I make him look good? I want people to say, and I tell them this, you know what? Those guys sounded pretty. I enjoyed listening to those guys. But then that analyst was really good. He made good points. If they say that, then I've succeeded. And then, so then, then you're spelling. <laughs> yeah. So that Cuppy will appreciate that. My last question, then we'll turn it over to you all. Our quote of the day on our new House Sports Media Center website today is from you, and it says, I'm paraphrasing, I get more nervous teeing off in front of a few strangers <laughs> than broadcasting to millions of people. That's true. I mean, I don't get nervous, um, you know, broadcasting a game. Although I will say of all the sports that you do, NFL, because you have a week between games is compelling. You have a little butterflies before you go do a broadcast because so much is expected after a week off, you know, after the, they've talked about the game for a week and now there's another game. But uh, although I will say this for you golf fans and there's a guy named Philip Sparks, and he's a British pro, and his whole thing is based on relaxation, no tension, just swinging and being calm. And you know what? I read his whole book, 250 pages on the flight here today. I used it the other day to success. I don't think I'll be as nervous anymore with four guys watching me. <laughs> what would you like to know? I think we have a microphone to pass around. So show us hands. Is anybody handling this microphone, by the way? All right, so if not, talk up really loud. Oh, here comes the microphone from the back now. All right, James, you had your hand up before, so let's bring the mic down to you, and then we'll take your question. This microphone is coming to you via Pony Express and should be down <laughs> and here in two, front. So you have, yeah. There you go, right down here. 
God bless you. It's all good. But you hold music now. Do, 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 and by the way, do, do, do. feel free to ask anything. Anything you want to ask, you know, if, if I don't answer it, I won't. But I mean, <laughs> no, but ask anything. You won't know unless you ask. All right, James, go for it. Well, you, you just, you, um, something that you said. What's yeah. your name? Oh, James Adam, I'm right here. Oh, oh yeah, James. <laughs> you, had the, you had the ribeye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you did, too. You, you said that throughout, you said that you didn't want, you, you told us not to make waves or do those things of that nature in the, in the business. But you also said that without you making waves your own, you wouldn't have been able where you get, you wouldn't have been able to get to where you are right now. Right. And so my question is, is the idea that you just want people, if they really, if it's something they want to stand for in the business, then they should just leave and move on? And well, uh, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was lucky. I was lucky because uh, it might not have turned out the way it turned out for me. But I, uh, if, if I made a habit of that, let me, let me put it this way, James. If I made a habit and people said, you know, Dick Stockton has been with three stations and he sued them all. I don't think anyone would want to hire me. I don't know if you'd get to three. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, but what I mean by don't make waves, you know, it means don't be battling. And if you don't like the way things are going, if you think you're, you know, uh, you know, people are going to, they, a guy is going to come in and run a station or a company, and he's going to have his guy come in, and he may replace you or demote you. And you have to make the decision, am I going to weather this, hang in because maybe I'll still be okay with this guy, or I've got to get out of here. You have to use your judgment, and, but use judgment not based on ego or pride. Okay, does that make it clear? Okay. Hey, before we continue, could I get a volunteer to help this fine young man take one of those mics so he doesn't have to run up and down, and then one person can be high and... Go ahead, Brian. Thank you. All right. Who else has a question for Dick Stockton? Right Hi, uh, I'm Seth. Um, from I, where? I guess, Tell me where you're from, too. I'm from New Jersey. Okay. Um, my question, uh, technology aside, uh, what's the biggest difference in the games, in preparation, in technique, um, that you've seen from when you started to now? Well, I, you, know, you know, I don't know about the prep. I will tell you this, and uh, that's a good question, Seth, because uh, my philosophy of broadcasting is it's not about the preparation, it's about the reaction. Everyone prepares for a game. You could prepare, and you can have a paragraph on every guy who's playing in the game. And today, because of the internet, people can know about you know, you don't have to explain who Colin Kaepernick is. To, you know, you don't have to say, hey, he was in the Super Bowl. He almost won. He won. People know that. Or, as Pat Summerall, didn't care whether you knew it or not because it's right now. So the, to me, what counts is I cut back in preparation. I know, I know who they are and what's going on. But I don't want to over-prepare because when you over-prepare, you tend to use what you prepared. Hey, I spent, I spent three days in this. Rams press guide, man, I'm using it. And it's, the game sounds lousy. But how do you react to the game? That because television is so complicated, you've got the replays, and you have, a, you, know, you have a spotter, a statistician, you have a partner, and you have all this monitors in front of you, and promos to read. Guys at home are watching the game. If they know more than you do as far as, hey, how come they don't call a timeout? You know, they're 40 seconds to go, they have two timeouts left. Why haven't they called? You have to say that. Or you have to say, hey, you know what? You know, they have to pass it to the sideline now and stop the clock. There's not enough time left. You have to be savvy enough to react to whatever happens in the game. You can't prepare for any of that. You just have to know, you know, know. And I've seen thousands of games even before I did number one. Uh, you have to know the game. Forget about know who the people are because you have a, an analyst who's going to say, hey, hey, he's a great cover corner, or you know, this guy is great in space, or his hands are the best. He says that. You don't do that. I always tell, I, you know, the two of the great guys I've worked with, Jim Cott, who is a, a baseball analyst, a great lefty with the Twins, among other teams, and Eric Heide, 
Eric Hyden was uh, maybe the greatest Olympic athlete. I worked with him when Dan Jansen won his speed skating medal in Norway in 94, which is my second biggest moment after Fisk. And I always told these guys, I do the who and the what, you do the why and the how. I can't do the why and the how. I can, <clears throat> I can say it, I have no credibility, I didn't play. I'm telling you why a guy is good. I read it, come on, you played the game. You do the why and the how, I do the who and the what. It's all about journalism, you know? There was, a, the, there was a Dodger announcer before Vince Scully named Red Barber, and he always used to say, when you come on the air, what does today's game mean? So I still use journalistic you know, tendencies when I come on the air in a broadcast. It's journalism. I'm doing the lead of what the game is all about. You know? I'm, I do the lead, okay? So the Rams may be in contention here, have won a game, have a division game, 49ers try. And what is the game about? That's what I do when I start the broadcast. And then I go from there. It's reaction more than preparation. Don't skip on preparation, but don't overprepare. Does it bother you that some people will say vehemently, <coughs> calling play-by-play -play is, is not journalism? I mean, sports doesn't matter. How do you respond to that? You sound like Howard Cosell. <laughs> the playground of journalism. Yeah. He's a microcosm of citizen. Anyway, <laughs> that too. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it is journalism because you're reporting. Anytime you're reporting, it's journalism, okay? Anytime you report, whether you're a sideline reporter, you're reporting, it's journalism. So it is journalism, it isn't serious journalism because people are watching the game. I don't talk about how much money a guy makes, ever. There are others that do. I'm just giving you my opinion. He, he's got an $8 million contract. You know, uh, he was suspended four games for Substance abuse. Back after, you know why? Because people are working nine to five, they're working in a mill, or they're working in, in a 7-Eleven and they're behind the counter. And now comes Sunday and they're watching a the football game. You know what? They want to enjoy the game. I'm not going to bring them down, and you do get brought down. Substance abuse. I don't do it. I don't say everyone is a great player. I mean, first of all, it's not my job to comment about that, but I say they haven't done this, they haven't done that, they can't score, I'll do that. I'll report the game, but I won't do any of the other stuff, and that's just me. What about the Volquez story last night? Excuse me? What last, Good. last night was the, I mean, the topic is that as the Volquez, the pitcher for the Royals. Fox, Fox did the right thing, obviously because the Royals didn't tell him, right? That's the understanding of it. Well, where do you get the right without confirmation to say that Edison Volk's father, you know, passed away? I mean, it's just people want to scoop, you know, they want to scoop what? The Royals didn't tell him till after he was out of the game. If that had come on, that would have been bad. I don't think it's, it's just my, my opinion. I have, you know, Strong feelings about certain things, and uh, you know, and I, and that's one of them. Richard, over here. Yeah. Oh, we have a fellow in the orange sweater, Sir, Syracuse. Uh, hi, Dick. Uh, be next. Richard Block. I'm from the class of '74. That's 1874. Um, you mentioned. No, that. I'm 1874. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned Kurt Gowdy, and he was a great broadcaster, but in his latter years, he came under a lot of criticism. Um, some of it, I think, was, was warranted, some maybe not warranted. Was it a case of him staying too long, spreading himself out, covering too many different events? What was the, no, the I think it, from that? I think that happens to people. It happened to Pat Summerall. It happens to all of us. And the, the question is, do you, do you get out before it gets bad? What happened was he had one really unfortunate basketball game, a UCLA-Kansas game. Uh, 
and uh, he had a problem with that. Could have been helped by the producer, you know, on pronunciation of names. But, you know, to say about Kurt Gowdy at the end is like saying Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning, it's, going to end, it's not going to be a pleasant finish for Peyton Manning. And it could be this year. Okay? But you stay too long? I mean, I don't know. Who, who, nobody, I think, ever really leaves while they're at the top of their game. You know? I don't think anyone ever leaves at the top of the game. They go, they go as long as they can. After Kirk Gowdy left NBC, he joined CBS and did football for several years and did a good job, you know? But, uh, you know, to me, you know, uh, not because I'm at that stage myself, but I never looked upon guys at the end and, and, and thought they were ever defined by that because everyone is gonna hit that point. Yes. Hi, uh, it's Brett from Syracuse. Um, you talked about a lot of uh, Hall of Fame, like yourself, um, people. Um, who would you say the, I guess, handful of, of individuals that are either in the business now or coming up, who would you say are, are the future Hall of Fame broadcasters? Oh, uh, it's hard for me to, uh, you know, to, 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 to do that. I mean, because uh, I would, I would, I might leave somebody out, and uh, by not including somebody, I might. Uh, you know, um, I mean, the people that I respect, that I respect in the business uh, now, I think uh, I, happen to, I happen to like Joe Buck. I, know, I, I happen to think Joe Buck is the best young talent I've ever seen, you know, come into the business. Uh, so I think Joe Buck is great. Uh, Sean McDonough, to me, has always been a solid play-by-play -play guy. He's always been good. Um, and who's the fellow you're going to have here, uh, come here from Arizona? Oh, Dave Pash. Dave Pash, excellent play-by-play -play guy. I talk to Dave. We, he and I talk a lot. And uh, what I like about Sean and Dave, and uh, those guys are who they are. They're not trying to be more than who they are. They're solid play-by-play -play guys. They do a solid job. They're smart. They know how to do it, and they do a good job. There's a young guy at Fox named Joe Davis, who I think is going to be a star, a superstar in this business. He's working college football for us right now with Brady Quinn. Uh, and you may be hearing about him in a very big way before long. But Joe Davis is, a, is another one who I think is terrific. So there you have it. Yes. We have one, a Yankee and a, is that a? Go, go to Crystal, we'll go to Cuppy. A Sixer. Thank you. My name is Chris. I'm from uh, Connecticut. And just for, what, as you were kind of coming up in the business and as a young kid, what broadcasters did you emulate? And how can young broadcasters take an example from the broadcasters they look at now without, while still being able to develop their own style? Good question. Um, the guys who, uh, that helped me were, um, and you know, you may not remember some of these guys, were Kurt Gowdy, who I've talked about, and Lindsey Nelson who was a, you know, uh, a great network announcer and a great uh, in the New York Mets, voice of the New York Mets. Lindsey Nelson, by the way, um, called uh, Notre Dame football on Saturday on TV, CBS football Sunday, and Monday night radio. He did all three of those things. And I was driving with him once because I was doing post game. I said, Lindsey, how do you keep track? He says, Dick, I don't even remember who number 32 was today. I don't even remember the final score of this game. Or I'm already on to the next one. He had the ability to memorize and get the teams and never forget what happened. Now this, gone, and now he's, So those are the guys I liked. Uh, there was a Detroit Tiger broadcaster named Ernie Harwell, who was around forever. Um, you know, I thought I, I, I liked him. What I did, when I listened to the good ones, I listened to the vocabulary that they would use, and the way that they would pace themselves. I don't, you know, if I hear a, a sportscaster play by play, he's some kind of player, or wow, if I hear a lot of wows, mute button goes on, you know. Use words, and don't scream. Today, we have guys that do that. 
and it's the time. I know people want that. You guys, how many people like screamers doing play-by-play? -play? Raise your hand. Okay. How many guys like guys that will use a, a minimum of words? Just ask. It. Okay, so it's almost even, you know, whatever it is. But it goes in waves. And, uh, you know, Pat Summerall, I don't know if you remember him. And look, there are different guys coming up. But I can tell you this, Joe Davis, the guys that I have mentioned, Sean McDonough, they are not guys who scream. And they've been around. They've been around a long time. They're not old, old they're not old timers at all. So we had uh, one of the Philadelphia 76ers. Hi, uh, I'm Chris from Philadelphia. Matter of fact, I actually work at uh, your first stop, KYW, right now. So Where now? KYW. Do you? Yeah, yeah. It used to be on Walnut Street. It's on uh, Spring Garden. No, I know, but it used to be on uh, 1619 Walnut Street when um, I worked there. At <laughs> At some point in your career, did you ever think about maybe switching paths? Did you ever get tired of doing play-by-play -play or like even like the '90s or like sports I, talk? No, I, I never got tired. No, I didn't. I really never did. I, it's a good question. Uh, I never got tired. Of, I, I've never gotten tired of doing. I love. I love doing sports broadcasting. As a matter of fact, as my play-by-play -play stuff winds down, I'm going to be doing podcasts. Uh, you know, for a company that's going to be sponsored, speeches where I'm going to go do talks, and uh, I'll do talks about some of the things that we've talked about here tonight, and I'll do podcasts. I'm going to do a 30-minute podcast on anything I want about sports. Anything it could be who has the best basketball uniforms in in in, in the NBA. I'll interview people. I'll have Q and A. Anything that I want. And I will be able, the reason why it may be effective, it could be effective, is that I can relate to what's going on now with things that I remember in the past. I was in Pittsburgh when the Steelers dynasty started with Chuck Noll. I remember things and I can connect and have, there's a history of things that you can tie in with what's going on today. So I think, you know, that might work. But I got the Bruin first. Thanks so much. Uh, he doesn't Carter. have the microphone though, so cut me first and then. I may room. repeat the question. Okay. <laughs> Mike Carter, I'm from New Hampshire. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, you. Can you talk about when you were originally starting out and you mentioned going to that Yankee game and with your recorder and calling play by play? What were some of your biggest hurdles that you found that initially you needed to overcome? Well, you're always in competition. I mean, that's the biggest hurdle you have is that there's another guy who wants the job. Some guy may have bit more experience than you do. And, uh, and you just have to say, I'm going to be good at this. You know, and I felt that I had, you know, I mean, I don't know if I was that good. I mean, I, I just felt that by assignments that I had when I joined CBS, here's how I got to CBS. I was working at KDKA in Pittsburgh, doing the nightly 6 and 11, all because of one guy, basically, in the company, Westinghouse Broadcasting. So now I'm there, and now uh, I, I get invited over to the offices of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Art Rooney, senior, and Dan Rooney, who I'm still friends with Dan to this day, said, you know, we, we like what you do. They called CBS and said, we have a guy here in Pittsburgh you ought to hire to do work, to do post-game shows, whatever you have. And that's how I got into the network. So, you know, uh, I never had a father who was in the business, I never had connections, but I was helped by the Roonies initially as far as getting with the networks. Can I clarify my, cl my question? Sure. Just, uh, personal technique, I guess, wise. What, what did you struggle with initially in your play-by-play -play career? Um, well, <clears throat> the first time I ever did any play-by-play -play in my life was in Pittsburgh. I did the Steelers preseason games and they were playing the Cardinals in St. Louis. They were in St. Louis at the time. And I was doing a half, and this other professional guy named Stu Nahan from Philadelphia was also doing a half. You remember Stu Nahan. And so the game started. This is my first game ever. And it was going too fast. Where's the ball? Who, ha, who the time? What, down? I, hold. I wanted them to stop. <laughs> Let me catch up. 
Let me, what da, down, it's third, and, and what, who made to tackle, what, the quarter, incomplete, what? It was going too fast. And then later that year, uh, Bill Burns, who had been on the radio in a, a TV in Pittsburgh, was doing a telethon. So I went to Green Bay to do a Steeler Packer game. And I met Ray Scott for the first time. Ray Scott, by the way, was a famous, famous, in fact, Summerall learned from Ray. Ray Scott used fewer words than Pat Summerall. And he said to me, Dick Ray Scott, but a longtime Packer announcer, you know, used to say, star, dollar, touchdown. That's how we would call the play. So, so he would say, you know, Dick, and here I'm 24 years old, scared to death, I'm in Lambeau Field here. And he says, you know, when Bart goes back, I see Dollar down there. And I see this guy. I said, Ray, I'm lucky if I see this. I can't even, how do you do it? And you know what it was? Experience. Because what happens is, it's all fast in the beginning. Every sport, fast. And then the more you do it, to me, every game is in slow motion. Every game I do is in slow motion. It's like the replay in slow-mo, that's how I see the game. Dice goes back, I see this, I see the blitz, I see this 23 coming in, I see it all. Experience, it's, it's 40 years of doing this stuff. That's, that's why I'm able to do it. So I would say the lack of experience is always the biggest hurdle, if that answers it. Okay. Lewis. Given what we've heard tonight, which has been enjoyable and insightful, total information. Thank you. Are you in the sports business or are you in the journalism business? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm in both, actually. Because, you know, then that goes, it goes back to the question of journalism doing play by play. Is that journalism? Um, you know, if you're watching the evening news, you're finding out what the news is, and they send a reporter, there's a fire, they send it out to a reporter who's reporting on a fire. When I'm doing a game, it is partially entertainment and partially reporting. Because, again, if you're at home having a Bloody Mary on a Sunday, and you're now going to go to work on a Monday morning, and you have to fight the traffic at seven, you want to enjoy the game. Now, we have nothing to do with whether you enjoy the game or not, to be honest with you. It's what's happening on the field. We can enhance the interest. We can ruin the interest by talking too much and being annoying, trying to be funny. We're not comedians. There may be something that's funny in the game. Whatever, it works. But then you have to use judgment as to whether there is humor or not, okay? It's certainly not a joke, and it's certainly not about you. So it's not about us. So I know that doesn't answer the question, but we're not strict journalists, because if we were, we would be saying, or I would be saying, and I'm, you know, and I'm, journalism is important to me, that this guy, you know, uh, had spousal abuse, and that's why he's missed the first half of the season. I will never say that in a game, because the audience that I have for watching and enjoying the game May know it, may not know it, let them find out somewhere else. That's me. That's a good place to end. Uh, before you all come down and say hello, if you have questions, we you come down and ask them. Are we allowed to do a few more? Um, or are you, uh, I don't deadline? know. Are we allowed to do a few more over there? Yeah, we... Oh, good. Stand. Okay. Just a... <laughs> go ahead. A so few more. Two more. Got, well, let's, by, uh, by a few can I, can I, three more. Can I say five and we'll quit? <laughs> you can, but I know you won't. Five and we'll quit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name is Gordon Gordon from New Jersey. So you mentioned that you mentored and taught some athletes to be um, analysts. Yes. Are you considering teaching or mentoring any women to become analysts or I'm, I'm sorry. play by play? Am I? Mentor, uh, considering uh, mentoring or teaching any women. Oh, I would mentor, you know, no one has ever asked me to mentor play by play. That's easier for me to do than mentoring an analyst who's working with me. But uh, absolutely, I mean, I think the field is, you know, I, you know, I, I tell you what, I think the field is open for that and, and I will do it. And that actually is going to be, if you get to my website, 
some one of the things that I'm that I would do. I'm going to be mentoring people that want to be in broadcasting. You know, I mean, I'm going to do that for you know my next life. Yes. Um, Zach, you've got the mic. Zach, Go. you've got right. the mic. Zach. <laughs> well, well, my name's Zach. Uh, I'm from North Carolina. Um, first off, thank you so much. It's been really great listening to you tonight. Thank you. Um, you know, you've talked a lot about how people today, they'll yell and scream and just throw out so many words. What, what are your thoughts on the future of the business? Oh, the future of business is great. I mean, you know, uh, athletes are better today. Uh, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're faster. Uh, I think I listen to play-by-play -play guys, and they do a great job. I'm serious. I mean, I listen to young guys. Hey, I came up listening to certain people, and, and I was successful. So the guy that comes up, you know, Dave Pash, successful, really solid. The guy who's coming up, you know, and following Dave Pash is going to be they're be Everyone in this world, I think, is better because they have so much to draw on, and their talent is there. And they want to do it. I mean, I, I came to Syracuse never wanting, never thinking about getting on the air. And I've had a, a, a successful play-by-play -play or broadcasting career. What about people who have come here? Well, we've seen they're all out there now who are successful. And it's still going to happen. So I think the future is great. I mean, I will never be one of those guys that says, you know what, it was better. And I have people come up to me, you know. I don't watch these games. You know, I, don't, I can't watch it anymore. It's... Yeah, it's not the same as it was. I said, you're too old. You know? <laughs> That's what I say. You're too old. I said, you know what? You got to be with it because, you know what? My dad used to talk about Melot. <laughs> Who's Melot, dad? You know, he played in the 30s, for crying out loud. I mean, really. So now people don't even remember Julius Irving. You know, there are players in the NBA who don't know who Julius Irving was. That's unbelievable. Unbelievable, and it's true. And you know what? Someday somebody's not, somebody won't remember who, I won't say Michael Jordan, but they will not remember who Kevin Durant was or somebody. You'll see years from, I mean, 100 years from now, but they won't. All right, we got four more to go. <laughs> see, already that's two plus four is five. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Nick from Miami. Um, Fox Sports is from a where? Place, uh, Miami, Florida. Okay. Born in Boca, went to Miami. Okay. Um, <laughs> Fox Sports is a big stake in uh, international soccer because they uh, have the future race to the World Cup. Um, because Johnson experiment didn't work out as well as they hoped, um, do you think the future of soccer broadcasting is uh, going to be more Americans or like, or is it, it going to be more English than like it has been? No, I think no, I think it will be more more Americans. I really do. I think uh, and you know soccer. I mean, how about the Women's World Cup? I mean, how great was that? And uh, the ratings that it got now unbelievable. I mean, I think women's sports has really you know, you know, grown and blossomed, exploded. It has been tremendous. And, uh, and I think you're gonna see women, Beth Mowens, I mean, there is no limit to what we're, we're going to find out in, that we see in this business. There'll be American guys that do soccer because now soccer is becoming you know, a, a foregone conclusion in, in the United States, World Cup soccer. So it isn't just the Premier League anymore. It's MLS and all those things are becoming you know, bigger. I mean, MLS may not become Premier League, of course, because of the history, but yes, the answer to the question is yes, there'll be American soccer play by play guys. Three more, and that's it, folks. Yes. Hi, I'm Jesse from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, what high school did you go to? Midwood High School. Have good tennis teams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you think the invention of, uh, of Twitter and having a response going on from the public during a game? has affected the way that you broadcast a game? Uh, it doesn't affect me at all. Uh, it's here to stay and it's big. Uh, I don't have a Twitter account. I don't do social media. I don't do that at all. Um, it's, the way, it's the way of the world now. It doesn't mean I have to do it. And so I don't. But uh, it shouldn't, let me put it this way, it shouldn't affect. Because if you have a, a broadcaster who during the commercial break you know, is on his iPad or laptop, whatever, and is checking to see what people are saying about the game and then reacts to that, I think you're, you're opening up a can of worms. So it's difficult. So actually, I don't even, you know, read that because uh, I think it's great. 
people, this is the way it is now, and I understand it and respect it, but that doesn't, but I'm not affected by it. Yes. I'm Carly from Forest Hill. Forest Hills, yes. So um, you mentioned how this business is so competitive, but it seems like you value helping people over really getting above your competition. Why? Well, I'm, I'm helping you know youngsters or any, but I, I I don't I've never had to help my competitors because you know they felt that they were competing with me and they were you know as good if not better than I was. So what I do is I'm I'm helping sports analysts. Uh, you know, like if, if Joe Davis, you know, who's, who I think is going to be a star, is 29 years old, were to come to me and ask me, he did as a matter of fact, uh, advice and stuff, I, I would give it to him because he's the wave of the future. So I help the wave of the future and I help analysts to succeed because I think I know how they can be more effective in doing their job as, as expert analysts on broadcast. Give her the mic. Is your mic up there still? Because I have two hands up there in the next. We, we want to get oh, back up there. The okay, so go, go ahead, Ariel, and, and then uh, the two up there. We spoke about emails and sports, and we can see them kind of inching in a little bit. We saw it in the playoffs in baseball. Yes. We see it with Beth Mullins. But what's the barrier that you feel women really need to break that they haven't really broken through yet? Well, I, they're starting to break through. I think. I've always thought that, and, and this is happening, women who know sports like guys know sports. Not, root, not like sports, know sports, know the game. But we're seeing that. I mean, daughters are growing up with their fathers and they're, they're going to games and they're, they're understanding why you want a left-handed pitcher in this situation. I'm seeing it on the air, you know? The only other thing, again, is the strength of the voice that you hear on the air, okay? Uh, you know, you, you, if a voice is on for a long period of time, and this is God-given, it's not anything else, you know. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate, but, and there are a lot of guys that do what I do that don't have great voices that succeed, and, and some go by the wayside. But I think uh, developing authoritative ways, you know, it's a tough thing. But that, that looms, let me tell you, that, Ariel, that looms out there. Hi, Rebecca Thornburg from Massachusetts. Um, I just have a question. How do you stay neutral when your favorite team is playing or you're calling your favorite team? Like, how do you not just... Very easy. Judge? You're not a fan eating popcorn in the stands, and this is interesting. You are, you are concentrating, when you do a broadcast, you are concentrating on getting it right. You have, your mind, when, when, when I'm done with a broadcast, I'm exhausted because my concentration of the right personnel, how they do the things. You have to, I have done many Syracuse NCAA tournament games when I was at CBS, many of them. And do you know, I, I didn't even know they, I didn't even know it was my alma mater when I was doing the games. I couldn't, I was trying to get it, you know, I was just getting it, getting it right, calling it right, um, working with someone. You, you're, not, you're not back there um, as a fan. It's so different that there isn't one broadcaster that I know in a network situation who roots for one team. You know, when we did the Lakers and the Celtics, we used to go to Boston and everyone said, you're rooting for the Lakers. We go to LA, they say, you're Boston fans. You know why? Because if Boston was winning by 20 points, I'd ask Tommy Heinsohn, what do the Lakers need to do to get back in the game? I'm from Boston. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear what they need to do to get back in the game. Well, that's for the audience. And the same goes for when the opposite is the fact. So we don't root for anybody. We really don't. I mean, no one does. Last one. What was the time where everything went wrong and you were able to put all that aside and overcome it to put on a good broadcast? Uh, that's a good couple of times, a couple of times uh, we did, a, the Pistons were playing um, the Lakers in the NBA Finals in the late 80s. And it was really noisy at the Silver Dome. And I was working with Billy Cunningham. And, you know, you hear yourself, you have an IFB in your ear, so, you know, you hear 
yourself talk and you hear him talk, you know, because it's loud. And we started on, this is an NBA Finals primetime game. And we couldn't hear, we, I couldn't hear myself. So I don't know whether I'm on or not. You know? I'm talking and it's dead. I'm, I mean, I don't even hear the crowds yelling. And, I, and, and so, so I'm going, And if the producer doesn't say, hold it, we, we can't hear, you know, whatever it is, there's nothing I could do. But apparently they could hear me, even though I couldn't hear myself. Poise, poise. You gotta be poised, you gotta be, it's a great question. Things are going wrong, you gotta just say, don't crumble, be strong, be, be there, be poised, just go, go with it, go with it. You know, and that's what you have to do. It's, it's hard to describe, but it's something you must learn to pick up. And that is to be unruffled. Someone could throw something. Someone could throw something that could hit you. You gotta be un unruffled. It's, there's no preparation for it. Good question. Now a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. Thanks. Good on this, questions, guys. On this very stage, next week, one week from tonight, same time, 8 o'clock, Beth Mowens, our 2015 Marty Glickman Award winner, will be here to answer a lot of those questions that Dick has just answered from a different point of view, obviously. So I hope you'll be able to make it then. For now, we really worked for quite some time to find a place where we can bring you up here. Here you are, well worth it. Thank you, Dick Stockton. Thank you. 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 Thank you.